Today Claudia and I are in Brisbane. We're uh, here at Quantum Sales and we're here to speak to Ben Kelly. Now Ben's doing the sale design and the sale build of the new sales for the R42 that we did uh, the previous video on. It's a Tony Granger design. It's being built for Bob Dunn down in South Australia. It's being built here on the Gold Coast. So uh, we're going to go in and learn a little bit about what goes into sale design. The, uh, why they've chosen the materials they've chosen, a little bit about who Ben is. Let's go inside and have a chat. So I think what's probably quite interesting for a lot of the people would be to know a little bit about yourself. Yeah. You know, like what your sailing background is, how you got involved in sailing and, um, and also multi-hulls because you're pretty well known in Australia in the multi-hull racing fraternity. Yeah. And uh, yeah, how you became you know, so well known. And yeah, I feel like I've had a really lucky sailing life, which began basically when I was probably six in Sabos. Um, my dad was a Sabo sailor when he was young, so he got me into it when I was a kid, and my little brother Mick. And we just had fun in boats, you know, to start with, and we'd go muck around and tip it over and all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. and, and then we got into the racing at club level, and we just progressed up through, you know, national state championships and, and dinghies and skiffs and... That was mainly what I had experience in through my teens and um, got into a little bit of yacht racing and my dad also had always had catamarans, like beach cats, oh, yeah. you know, yeah. so he was in the Air Force and he raced for the Air Force in Hobie 16s and had A classes and paper tigers and those yeah, sorts of boats yeah. were always kicking around and, you know, family holidays would be mucking around on the cats. So I could understand and could sail cats from then, but I'd never raced them. Mm -hmm. and. Um, you know, I was lucky enough to get an opportunity uh, around the year 2000 when a good sailing friend of mine who'd been sailing on Trilogy, um, obviously one of Tony's great designs, um, rang me and said, look, I've got to pull out of this regatta. Um, it was a regatta up at Bowen, the rendezvous, and would you be interested in going doing bow on Trilogy? And I was like, of course, you know. Yeah. Um, and I'd already had a keen interest but hadn't really had access. Yeah. And I think that's one of the hard things is how to get into these sorts of boats. Um, but I was lucky enough to go sail with Keith Glover on, on Trilogy. Um, you know, he sailed the boat really hard. I learned a lot. I was way out of my depth. I started to learn the boat quite quickly and become quite a valuable asset to Keith. And I just really enjoyed it. I mean, like 2001, 2002. And then what followed was, um, you know, I was a sailmaker already, but... I started to get support from the people I was sailing with. Yeah. You know, and I was travelling around doing regattas mm. and I did sales that they liked and we had, you know, a lot of uh, success. So, yeah. and, and also getting stuck into the OMR rule and mm. optimising people's boats and it was, you know, basically getting more out of people's boats, helping them to sail their boats. Yeah. And that was the process, you know. Yeah, yeah. So can you tell us a little bit about Venom, how you got involved in uh, the sail design and build process that's being done with Venom, the R42? Yeah, well, obviously coming from my trilogy background, a bit of ducks nuts, I had a love for Granger design multi holes. Yeah. Um, I had a lot of time on the boat, so anything Tony's doing, I'm always interested in. Mm -hmm. Joel Berg's doing the rig, a great Lorimer rig, mm -hmm. you know, from France, it's gonna be great on this boat. We're great mates, and then Jamie and I did a lot of sailing, and my brother did a lot of sailing with Jamie back okay. in the day on Flat Chat. And, oh, really? Yeah, cool. Yeah, on yeah. Um, Trilogy, and basically, you know, I've done a lot of projects with him over the last five to ten years. Yeah. And, um, you know, Tony's always had a keen interest in what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And then the final piece of the, the puzzle is Bob the owner, mm -hmm. you know, who I've sailed a bit with on Carbon Credits, the Farrier 32 oh, cool. SR. Yeah. So I got to know him down in Adelaide where I've, I've done a lot of sailing. You know, how, do, how does he approach you on the subject of building the best sails for that boat? So Bob came to me as an initial meeting with Jamie Morris. Um, mm -hmm. He'd already established Jamie would be building the boat. He'd already been working with Tony Granger yeah. and they'd done a preliminary rig plan. Yeah. So those guys came to me and said, look, we want to get a good group together and this is going to be run as a project and we're going to establish our sail maker early, our mast maker, everything early. Yeah. So they identified that I was someone they wanted to deal with and we had a meeting and they put in front of me, this is the proposed boat and rig plan. Yeah. And they really just wanted to have a round the table chat about what I thought of the numbers, like rig height, sail yeah. areas, cool. 
what Bob wanted to achieve with the bow. That's yeah. what I'm always very interested in because, yeah. you know, you've got to get someone what they need to yeah. achieve, you know, their goals for the boat. Yeah. The boat's a real crossover boat. He's going to want to cruise it. Yeah. He's going to want to go out and probably get a race record awesome. somewhere, yeah. you know, and he's going to have some good guys to sail on it. So, you know, through that process... Jamie being Jamie was sort of winking at me going, do you reckon that rig can be a bit taller? Yeah, and, yeah. and, you know, the square head looked a bit big and the rig, to me, did look like it could be a bit taller. Mm. And I think Jay, um, Joel Berg was saying a similar thing. So through that process, we all spoke yeah. about it. I proposed um, some sail designs and some sail areas. Um, the main wasn't a lot bigger. It was just a bit taller and narrower, a bit more okay. efficient. Yeah. Um, the rig was a bit taller and... You know, through that, we came to a, you know, pretty good resolution that everyone yeah. agreed with. And, yeah. and Bob, being the owner, said, okay, let's do that. Yeah, right. Um, so what um, what have you ended up with? What is the sail plan? Well, basically, the rig's gone up to 19 metres. Yes, right. <laughs> it's a nice big tall rig. I heard the boat got wider as well. Yeah, the boat got wider. The, the boat is quite a wide platform. Yeah. It's going to have a huge riding moment. Yeah. Uh, it's going to be able to put a lot of horsepower down. It's going to create some big loads. Yeah. Um, you know, 42 foot try. It, it's going to have some pretty big loads from the numbers we're seeing. So yeah. I've upspec the sales as the process has gone along. Uh, the engineering has okay. gone up. Yeah. Um, you know, not because I'm nervous, but because I know what we're going to do with it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And uh, we need to be able to, to race the boat, and Bob wants to go and try and get good results and have yeah. no dramas. But he also needs durability and, mm. and something that can work for him when he's shorthanded. Yeah. You know, I, I think he's probably going to leave the dock with a reef in most of the time yeah, if, he's, yeah. <laughs> if he's cruising. Um, he's not going to need yeah. you know, that extra horsepower. And some of the race sails um, are going to become crossover mm. cruiser or delivery sails. Okay. So like a Hounds um, Code Zero, yeah. um, the upwind screecher will be pretty strong because it needs to try to go upwind. Hmm. So it will be a good, you know, yeah, heavy, heavy yeah, screecher. Heavy sail. Yeah, yeah, that right. we can ease out and run away with and still yeah. do pretty good miles. So. Yeah, right. Yeah. What, um, so I think he's got, what, three, all the sails on furlers? Is it a top down? The... Um, we're not going on furlers at this point, which okay. many people would say, what are you doing? Yeah, yeah, um, cool, yeah. We're going old school. Mm. Um, we're going to try, we're going to piggyback a few things from... The race shots and the TP52s on, yeah. on the biggest masthead A3, yeah. we're going to have zippers. Yeah. So um, you basically zip the sail up into a sock. Mm. The zippers come off those, the cars come off those zippers. And when you hoist, it's a bit like the modern day wooling. Yeah. The sail will pop. The zipper and, just undoes. Yeah, and we will freehand the sail down when we have our race crew. And, and that yeah. will be the race sail. Yeah. You know, and mainly we're thinking, you know, offshore sailing with mm. the boat. Yep. Um, and if we want to, we can put a top top down furlough on yeah, right. down the track. Okay. Um, so, but the reaches will be on furlers. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But the yeah. ASO will be. Yeah. Uh, yeah right. It's going to be old school. That's so, so cool. We'll try that. Um, it's not a huge sail. Yeah. None of the sails are overly huge. Yeah. Uh, the rig's tall. Mm. Um, we want the boat to rate well. Yeah. We want. Okay. We, you know, it's... Is that what reduces the sail area for well, waiting or...? there's no use going over the top in sail area. Yeah. Um, yeah, because you're going to end up with a boat that performs really well in mm. 0 to 12 knots and we need this boat to be on fire between 15 to 20 yeah. and still yeah. be rating well. Yeah, so. right. Is there anything you would have done? If it was your boat... If it was my boat... Yeah, is there anything you would have done a bit differently? I don't know. I, I know, I believe at this stage the boat is going to be getting a foil, and I, yeah. I support that, even though it has huge volume. Mm. It may not be there when the boat's launched, but that was something I had pretty serious chats with Granger about, and okay. I believe in that extra security, and, and having sailed you know, on the farriers that have those boards, even though they've had their issues, but also mainly on Will Perina, mm. who performed great offshore with a lifting foil, and also on Team Australia, the Orma. So you're talking about uh, curved foils yeah. and floats? Yeah, yeah. not yeah. big, mm. but just something you can press on and actually get more lift out of and, yeah. and skip across the top of the ocean swells yeah, instead right. of, you know... Yeah, a little bit more safety in those... Yeah, and that's something we found with Trilogy, you know, all those years doing Gladstones, once we got offshore, yeah. we struggled without any form of lift. 
you need to push. Yeah. Yeah. So it really limits your top speed, keeps, yeah. you know, your average struggles and I'd like to see this boat see its full potential. So yeah. I'd like to see that part of it go through, but there's dollar signs attached to all of that. Give us an idea of the um, sail area of the R42. Yeah, well, upwind, uh, she's going to have plenty of horsepower. We've got a main that's 69 square metres, a jib that's just over 40 square metres. And then we have an upwind screecher that is the secret weapon on these sorts of boats and yeah. um, is really going to get it to windward in 0 to 10 knots. And that's 70 square metres. Wow. So, you know, combined with that and under 10 knots, we've got just under 140 square metres. Some horsepower. Yeah. yeah, nice one. And, and, um, and what, what material has uh, been chosen as the final material? Yeah, if, if we t talk about, you know, the upwind sails, basically, um, we're going with a GPL light skin from Dimension Sailcloth. It's uh, been around for about five years. We've used it a fair bit in these crossover boats and also in people's boats that race that want a bit more durability than just a film film. Yep. So it's a race pedigree fabric internally with carbon and Technora Aramid yarns. Yep. And then externally it's got a sort of uh, poly unidirectional filament mm. of polyester that creates um, a layer or a boundary layer for the windows in the film to not split as the sail ages. And it's relatively light yeah, for an yeah. exterior, like compared to taffetas. Mm. Um, you know, it's about half the weight of a taffeta in terms of it, its actual weight. Basically, we know we're going to get enough years of life out of it. It's going to protect the internal structures of the glues, the fibres from the UV. Mm. And, you know, I've got some guys out there cruising pretty heavily with this as well. Who, yeah who race as well, mm -hmm. and you know, I wouldn't go and put this just on a cruising boat, yeah. but if someone needs to be able to race and expects results, then mm -hmm. they're going to need something at this level, yeah, and right. that's why we've gone for this cloth. Yeah, nice. Oh, yeah. yeah, it's always a compromise, you mm -hmm. know, and, and we're really trying to match a budget, we're yeah. trying to match the expectations of the customer and try to get the performance level they need. Yeah. Um, if we go too low, then they're going to lose the shape in the sail yeah. too early. Yeah. They may last for 12, 15 years, mm. but you know, yeah. in three years in, they're not going to be up to racing shapes anymore. Yeah. So it's yeah. about finding that happy medium. Exactly, yeah. And what's the sort of price of this stuff compared to your more racing laminates? Yeah, look, this, the most obvious choice for a cruiser racer is like yeah. a polyester double taffeta cruise laminate. Yeah. Um, you're going to be, you know, which is always the next step up from Dacron's. Yeah. This is going to be another twenty five percent on top of that. Yeah. Um, so it's you know over a whole set of sales that adds up. Yeah. And it doesn't necessarily hold together any longer. Mm. You know, so it's all about shape, shape. retention and performance. Yeah, 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 yeah. And what sort of uh, lifetime you expect out of it? Looked well looked after. Yeah, it, it's so hard that one yeah. because you know they seem to experience just completely different lives on yeah. the boats depending how they're used UV, um, temperature, yeah. yeah you know if someone is short-handed sailing up and down the coast mm. and and the jib gets a lot of flogging or yeah. you know they're reefing in and out on their own it's very hard on these sorts of cloths mm. if it's a couple cruising and they're sort of taking it easy then you know it'll cope with the loads yeah um but it needs to to be treated like the insides of that is a race fabric yeah. you know yeah so if it can be reasonably well looked after and not have too hard a life, um, the, the sales out of this could be eight to ten year mm. lifespan. Yeah, well, yeah. It won't be good. longer than that. Yeah. Um, and in certain circumstances, it, it could be a four to six year lifespan. Mm. You know, it's very hard to say. Yeah. As a sailmaker, to uh, any yachties out there, or any people that are you know sailing, what are the key points of getting durability and longevity out of your sails? Yeah, well, if I just talk about multi hull sailing, yeah. to start with, um, and we'll, we'll go to, to the windward sails. Yeah. Uh, firstly, if you're sailing along, ease them out, see how the boat feels, and then wind them back on. Don't just keep winding and winding and winding. People tend to oversheet their sails a lot, and that puts strain on the sails when it's not required. Okay. Um, you know, even in five to 10 knots of wind, if you're oversheeted, you can do damage to your sails. Yeah. Uh, so basically, stop oversheeting your sails all the time. Um, also, I think 
the stowage of the sails. There needs to be effort put in. Mm. Um, this day and age, everything is about everything being as easy as possible mm. and a bit of old-fashioned care and, you know, making sure your main sort of flakes down in the bag reasonably well. Um, you know, not having the upper leech of your head still flogging is a big one. Yeah. You know, because yeah. that is going to age that section of cloth like so rapidly. Yeah. You know, so move your cars forward or put a barber hauler on. Yeah. So most often with head sills, that's what we see. You know, is that upper right. leech is flogged out and the rest of it could look like brand new. Yeah. 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 The other one's enough luff tension. Yeah. You know, if you don't have enough luff tension, not yeah. crazy man luff tension, but yeah. you're going to point load, you know, your internal, your intermediate slides, your batten cars, yeah. everything like that. And that's when you're going to have problems. Yeah, right. Okay. It's a bit yeah. of fabric at the end of the day. So overall, what's your um, thoughts of the final outcome? Yeah, these are the dream yeah. projects. Bob's a great owner. Yeah. Obviously, you understand I love the people that are involved. It's great to be part of that. Yeah. And, and it's a little bit like building a sailing team. This is a build team. Yeah. And the communication's been great. And, you know, I think the end result is going to be a brilliant boat. Yeah. Uh, it's a great size boat for the east coast of Australia. And I know Bob wants to get down south as well. Yeah. All us on the east we'll be talking about the east. <laughs> but um, I think the yeah. end result's going to be a really quick boat that... Yeah. Bob's going to have a lot of fun on and he's also going to be able to actually go cruising and, and yeah. really enjoy it. Well, thanks for dropping by Quantum Sales, Jason and Claudia. Um, it's been really cool to catch up with you guys. I've been very jealous of the lifestyle you guys have carved out. You trimaran, watch net glide upwind and, you know, that's a real bucket list. Maybe one day I'll be doing that. Oh, but for now, I'm making sales on some pretty cool boats and having an absolute ball. So thanks Definitely. for uh, dropping by. It's nice Mate. to share it. Thank you for your time. No problem. Sharing your knowledge.